The 353rd District Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Madeline Connor presiding. Good afternoon. Calling clause number D1GN230737171. This one's a little long, but it's something we don't see very often. It's a doctor suing the Texas Medical Board. So first, let's get an idea of who all the players are. We have Judge Madeline Connor, which some of you might remember from the Alexia, Alexia case, where the attorney was a little, let's say, not on her game during a hearing and rage quit. Next to her, we have the two attorneys that say John Rivas Esquire. Those are jo Dr. Gavaria's attorneys. Ted Ross in the corner and Kathy Johnson down at the bottom and a couple other people that'll pop in and out represent the Texas Medical Board. And then we have Dr. Gavaria down at the bottom. Now he operates a clinic in Texas. He's a medical doctor and he also operates an imaging clinic, clinic or clinic um, practice where you go to get x-rays, CAT scans, um, mammograms, things like that. So they'll explain a little more and I'll pop in and out because I have quite a bit of background, but I don't want to overwhelm you with it right at the beginning. Judge, I'm here as well. I work with the medical board. I'm here simply in an observational capacity. All righty. Thank <laughs> you. All right. Opening statements. Um, good. Good morning, Your Honor. I, I just see if we can uh, have some housekeeping, if we can, we have submitted, um, I believe, 13 exhibits uh, into the job box for the court, and I believe that the defendant has submitted five. I don't know whether we can agree to um, have them admitted, or, you know, it's really up to them whether, uh, or do you want us to prove it up? You know, if they're agreeable to you, just have them admit it at this time. Do the parties have an agreement to the admission of plaintiffs or petitioners' exhibits uh, 1 through 13 and the defendants' ex uh, respondents' exhibits 1 through 5? We do have defendants have an objection to plaintiffs' exhibit 7. It is confidential under federal law, but we're okay with the judge looking at it herself, but not to have it admitted into the record. Uh, that's fine. And then, and then, Your Honor, I just want to be clear where we join um, petition exhibit number one. So it's only going to be two to 13. Two to 13 without seven. That's just going to come up when you offer it, right? Yes, Your Honor. And then we have no objection to... Um... I think on seven, they don't have an admission. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're seven. Yeah. I just, Your Honor, if, if we can clarify on number seven, um, this is a um, National Peti Petitioner Data Bank report submitted by the board. Um, and to the extent that... Uh, <laughs> My client can certainly talk about it, and then I, I, I don't know who. Yes, we getting to the to the to the matter to the TMB matter, and then to which would be a talk about doing the course of this hearing. So I'm not sure that perhaps we can waive that confidentiality. I'm not sure um, how we can handle this. Yes. So the, the for Exhibit Seven. Under Title IV, Section 1921, it cannot be permitted to be disclosed in an adverse action. So we don't believe that it, that privilege can be waived, but um, we are willing to stipulate that that order, um, you know, exists. And oh. we're also willing for the judge to review it in camera you know, just by herself, but we don't want it, it cannot enter into the record. Okay, so we can agree, we can stipulate as to the existence and I guess the content of that report, is, is that fair to say? E yes. Okay, great. Thank if you. I might okay. add, Your Honor, just real quick, we we, we also would have to object that, that we, some, we stipulate that the final order was sent to the NPDB but the other information in there, including physician reference numbers and things like that cannot be discussed 
uh, in open court. That's confidential. And there's a provision at the very bottom of that report that essentially says that, and it's labeled confidential at the top. So we, the court might not even need to see the exhibit if we stipulate that the, that the final order was sent to the NPDB. We don't dispute that. But if we start getting into the contents of it in testimony or, or, or argument, we do have an issue with that. That, uh, that's fine. I think as long as we're going to stipulate to the existence that um, the TMB submitted the final order to the to the MPTB. And, 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 and the yes. And then it's important to review the camera. Yeah, if the court would be willing to review the document in camera, um, just um, you know, in rendering your decision, I think that would be acceptable to us. Thank you. The stipulations are accepted. Petitioners exhibits two through six are admitted and eight through, eight through 13 are admitted and respondents exhibits one through five are admitted. And when it comes to issues relating to number seven, petitioners number seven, um, we can go off live stream. We can have somebody email it to me. It's just going to kind of, um, it's going to be taken up during the course of the trial. Thank you, Your Honor. Opening statements of petitioner, please. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, may it please the court. Um, Your Honor, this is plaintiff um, or petitioner, Dr. Jorge Guevara's application for a temporary injunction to enjoy uh, the enforcement of the Texas Medical Board's um, final agency order dated August 18, 2023. Um, the underlying matter um, for this case is a judicial review of an administrative decision pursuant to Texas Government Code um, 2001.171 et al. and Texas Occupation Code 2301.751. Um, uh, given the rather convoluted process in which how we got here, uh, it might be helpful to just for, for me to briefly summarize. Yes, um, and we also are on live stream, so you'd be surprised how many people watch this. So, all right, be detailed so, in your opening. Thank you. I will, I will summarize the uh, the administrative appeal process. Um, by way of background, Dr. Uh, Guevara has been a licensed physician in the state of Texas for almost three decades. Um, in the past 20 or so years, he has been the owner of a medical practice, um, Medical Associate of Brownsville, MAB, uh, which is located in Brownsville, Texas, a, um, a historically um, underserved area medically. Um, during the course of a hearing, you will hear um, evidence. You see evidence that MAB is separate into four separate department or units um, in his practice. Um, it includes a family medicine practice, a radiology department, a physical therapy, occupational therapy department, and a sleep center, four separate um, departments. Um, and then each department has its own managerial team and dedicated staff um, that are operating and running those individual units or departments. And they, for the most part, operate independent of one another. Um, you will hear testimony from Dr. Guevara that he personally runs and manage only the family medicine practice, um, which is a, a, a typical um, family medicine practice. Um, he sees patient there, he makes diagnosis, write prescriptions, he over see and supervise his nursing staff within the confine of that department. Um, and he's a person that handles day-to-day and that is where um, he practices medicine utilizing his medical license. Um, with respect to the radiology department, um, the MAB department, radiology department, provide a all sort of different kind of radiology study, including x-rays, uh, bone density scans, ultrasound, CT scan, and finally, mammography. Um, you will hear evidence that Dr. Guevara's involvement with the radiology department is very limited. Um, in fact, virtually all of the business and managerial aspect of that department is handled by his business manager. And then, um, the lead interpreting physician, who is a licensed radiologist, uh, is responsible to interpreting all the films and studies and issue reports 
and handle um, and supervise the radiology te technician that are working in that department. Um, the only involvement that Dr. Guevara had with respect to the radiology department is that he was at one point um, appointed as the radiation safety officer, or ESCO, for that department. Um, you'll hear evidence that um, under 25 Texas Administrative Code 289.252, um, a radio radiation safety officer or ESCO is a administrative position. Um, it is responsible to ensure that the machine, X-ray machines, mammography machine, is not emitting excess radiation to ensure the safety of the patient and to the staff members. Um, it is by no means a medical position. Um, a radio safety, a, a RSO does not practice medicines. Um, in fact, the only qualification to be an RSO is that you need to have a high school diploma and then you complete a four day training course and pay a fee. And anybody could be a radiation safety officer. Um, in 2018, the Department of State Health Services, uh, DSHS, um, which is the state agency who is responsible for certifying and regulating all the radiology practices, um, also in, food, in enforcing any regulation or rule pertaining to uh, a radiology practice. Um, they conducted a routine inspection at uh, MAB, radiology department. Um, the, in, that inspection identified several technical violations um, concerning um, the mammography procedures. And then you, it bear emphasis that the only deficiency identified during that inspection pertain only to mammography and nothing else. <clears throat> Judge, you're muted if you're speaking. Your Honor, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. So, I, I think that I uh, understand now that you said mammography. I just. Mammography. Thank you. you My apologies. Um, so the, the deficiency identified by DSHS during that inspection pertain only to mammography and nothing else. There has never been any finding of deficiency pertaining to the x-ray, CT scan, bone density scan, ultrasound, um, nothing else. Um, as a result of, this, of the citation um, of violation by DSHS, um, a fine a administrative penalty was imposed on the business, MAB, but not against uh, Dr. Guevara personally. Um, DSHS, uh, upon the conclusion of their state case, um, did not revoke MAB certification to operate a radiology practice or in any way limit Dr. Guevara's ability to own or operate or affiliate with a, any radiology practice. Um, MAB promptly paid the fine when the case was, was closed. And then in around 2021, um, the Texas Medical Board decided to um, commence a disciplinary action against Dr. Guevara's license personally, um, citing the exact same violation from the DSHS case, which has been already adjudicated. Um, in its complaint to the State Office of Administrative Hearing, um, the TMB, among other things, argued that those DSHS violations uh, constitute a violation of Texas Occupation Code Section 164, 0.052A5, they claim that those violations are uh, connected to uh, Dr. Gavar's practice of medicine. And on December 12, 2022, um, the, Dr. Guevara and the TMB appear at a contested hearing at SOA before Judge ALJ Sarah Stein, uh, Stearns. I'm sorry. Um, the TMB requested for and was granted collateral, collateral estoppel effect on the finding of violation by DSHS. So there's no additional or independent evidence presented at, at the TMB SOA case. Um, the TMB argued again that by virtue of Dr. Guevara's ownership of the practice, that essentially any violation of law is connected to his medical practice of medicine and therefore subject to the disciplinary authority of the TMB. Um, which we argue that is a uh, forced premise. 
but somehow um, ALJ uh, Stern accepted this false premise and then fined in favor uh, for the TMB. Thereafter, the TMB issued its final administrative order on August 18, 2023. The order seeks to restrict Dr. Guevara's medical license and stated that Dr. Guevara quote, shall not own, comma, operate, comma, act as a radiation, radiation safety officer for, comma, act as a medical director for or otherwise be associated with any imaging program. You hear testimony by Dr. Guevara that under this order, the way it's written, that um, MAB radiology would not be allowed to perform any radiology studies, whether besides mammogram, he would not be allowed to perform X-ray, ultrasound, CT scan, anything that has never been found to be in violation of any law. Um, you will also see evidence um, that um, DSHS has the sole authority to regulate the certification and enforcement of rule to a radiology practice. And then the DSHS has specific program in monitoring CT scan and X-ray and mammography. And then in terms, the TMB's final order exceeded the TMB's statutory authority uh, because it in coach what was under the exclusive jurisdiction of the SHS. I'm gonna make comments as I go because I haven't watched the whole thing and I'm scared if I wait to go back, I'll forget because you know I blink and I forget what I was saying. But anyways, I looked up the complaint with the Texas Medical Board and his attorney was just arguing that it's not fair that he was only found negligent as it relates to one machine, the mammography machine. You know, he still has all the other exam, other types of examinations that he does, or I'm sorry, testing. And, you know, he shouldn't be found in, in violation just because of that one thing. And the penalty relates to all of them. But the thing that he was found in violation of was not providing proper supervision, not being on site where you're supposed to be to supervise the machine and make sure it's being operated properly as the radiation safety supervisor, and also not having staff trained and maintaining records. So those actions alone relate more to his conduct in general, not the specific operation of a single machine, which I think is why the Texas board extended this to all areas of his practice. But that's just my opinion. Um, you, you also hear from Dr. Guevara that if the TMB final order is enforced today and the, and the temporary injunction is not granted, he'll be forced to shut down his business, his radiation department entirely. He would have to send away all, all of his patients and would deprive these patients of the benefit of a, continue, a continuation of care. He would have to terminate all the employees that are associated under those under the radiology department. Um, all the machinery are subject to a rental agreement, so Dr. Kufar would be forced to breach all those contracts as well. Um, and as stipulated, um, the TMB has reported the final um, TMB order to the National Petition State Bank already. As a result of this reporting, as well as the existence of the TMB order, a number of um, insurance company, insurance carrier, has already indicated to Dr. Guevara that they are contemplating ter uh, to terminate Dr. Guevara's um, network enrollment status. Um, if the TMB order is enforced, there is a real likelihood um, that um, those insurance would drop Dr. Guevara's practice out of the network and Dr. Guevara would have no choice but to not stop seeing those patients. And then he would force to abandon, abandon those patients. And this would extend not only to the radiology department, but would extend to the other units of the practice. And it would jeopardize the viabilities of Dr. Guevara's practice in its entirety. Um, Based on these reasonings, at the close evidence, the court will believe that the court will find that the plaintiff has shown that um, we have alleged a viable cause of action with a likelihood of success. And then that if a TI is not granted today, Dr. Guva would suffer immediate and irreparable harm. And as such, we respectfully request the court to grant uh, Dr. Guevara's application for temporary injunctions and to issue an order maintaining static quos <clears throat> maintaining status quo until a final hearing on the merit. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, Ms. Johnson, are you doing the opening statement for the medical board? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Your Honor. The Texas Medical Board request that you deny plaintiff's request for a temporary injunction. <clears throat> um, would you like a moment, Your Honor? Okay. Sorry, the dog was barking. Go ahead. <laughs> so pl plaintiff has requested a temporary injunction and to receive one, he would need to show that he has a valid claim that he's likely to succeed on the merits of the underlying claim and that he faces imminent and irreparable harm. And plaintiff cannot carry that burden today. First off, plaintiff is not likely to succeed on the underlying claim because he cannot carry the burden of the substantial evidence rule. He cannot show that the Texas Medical Board did not act reasonably under the substantial evidence rule when it issued its final order. The Texas Medical Board acted with its authority when it issued its final order under the Medical Practice Act and its own disciplinary matrix. The Texas Medical Board also has substantial evidence to support its final order. Such evidence will be discussed, such as plaintiff hiring unqualified radiology technicians, not supervising those technicians, and delegating medical duties to these unqualified technicians. Today, I will discuss before the courts the substantial evidence which shows that the Texas Medical Board reasonably issued its final order and that <clears throat> there is authority for the board to do so. At this time, the Texas Medical Board requests that you deny the temporary injunction requested by plaintiff. Thank you. Thank you. You may call your first witness. Petition. If I made, um, this would be, this would be handling the risk examination. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. What? Um, this would be handling the risk examination. Oh, um, okay. Um, All right. I said petitioner. I thought I said petitioner, but go ahead. I'm sorry, my... Mr. Rivas, you may proceed. Thank uh, you. Your Honor, I call Dr. Guevara. All right, Mr. Go uh, sorry, Dr. Guevara, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? I can't hear you. You have to unmute. I wasn't, I wasn't muted. Sorry. I said, yes. Thank you. Could you please state and spell your name for the record? My first name is Jorge, J-O-R-G-E. My last name is Guevara, G-U-E-V-A-R-A. -E Thank you. All right, you may proceed, Mr. Rivas. Hi, uh, good morning or good afternoon, Dr. Guevara. Um, can you please uh, um, state your full name for the record? Jorge R. Guevara. And um, how are you employed? Uh, by Medical Associates of Brownsville. Mm -hmm. And um, are, what do you do for a living? I am mm -hmm. basically a board certified internal medicine physician. And I also, actually I am double board certified. I am board certified internal medicine physician and I am board certified in addiction medicine. Are you licensed by any state? The only state I'm licensed is in Texas. How long have you been licensed by the state of Texas? Since at least 90, I believe 95. <laughs> I was 95. And you mentioned double board certified. What does board certified indicate? What does it mean? Board, board, board a certified physician is an exceptional doctor, basically, and basically who has shown proficiency in in his or her expertise in the field, internal medicine or addiction medicine. 
Mm -hmm. And in order to be board certified, do you need to pass any tests or take any classes or tell us? You basically, after finishing medical school, you go for internship, then residency. And then after three years of training in, as an internist, basically you, 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 you have to pass a test actually. And then every 10 years you have to be board certified again. So this is my third, I believe second or third time that he was board certified internal medicine. And what were the areas, I didn't catch it. What are the areas of certification? Internal medicine and addiction medicine. Okay. And is are those the areas that your, your practice focuses on or can you explain? Yes, I am basically focused on adult adult medicine. Uh, most of my practice is basically low income elderly people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with many uh, handicaps or restrictions, you know. What does internal medicine mean? Internal medicine is going to be, I'm going to be, it's like a pediatrician for children. It will be the medicine for adults in which basically they're basically, they diagnose and they also order results and treat adults in basically pulmonary basically being a cardiologist with hypertension, or a diabetes, also rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis, you know, gastrointestinal symptoms, hepatitis. Also, we diagnose, you know, brain aneurysms, brain tumors, all of that, or oh, pulmonary embolisms. Also, we have been also for infections, like during the pandemia, we have been the we have been on the front line treating COVID-affected patients. You know? Yeah, when you say you're on the front line, what do you mean by that? You were open for business or what? No, when the front line meaning is we're seeing the patients, you know, like some especially in medicine, like radiology, they don't usually interact with the patients. They read x-rays, mammals, MRIs, CTs. We basically have to interact with the patients basically, or basically examine the patient order basically and treat the patients and dealing with the patients. That's the front line means. All right. So you were you were face to face with the patients. Yes. Right? Obviously with you know safety protections, you know. Okay. All right. Following and then the, the you mentioned MAB, are you the owner of or and founder of MAB? I, I am the founder of M MAOB, yeah. Mm -hmm. I am the founder. Okay. And MAOB stands for what? Medical Associates of Brownsville. Mm -hmm. And when did you found MAOB? I believe it was 95, I believe, or 96. 95? 95, yes. Okay. And um, how many, uh, uh, are you familiar with the term patient population? Yes, I am familiar with patient population, yes. What, can you describe the patient? What is it and can you describe it to the court? Well, the patient population is basically we divide by, basically by, by age. Also, by, by you know, in which most of my population are elderly people, 70, 80, 90, especially in Brownsville. You know, and also we had younger population, 20, 30, 40, you know, and in between, between 50 to 60, we have middle-aged populations. And most of my population has been around basically at least 60%, 60 percent, 70 percent elderly population. And um does your patient population have any particular um, characteristics with respect to disease or Ill, or illnesses? Yes, they have most of them. It's very common in this area. Of, I don't know, is diabetes, basically infections, high high blood pressure, heart disease. You know, strokes are 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 very common, and most of them is due to the poor compliance of these patients because they have difficulty to have access you know, to, to uh, basically to healthcare or they had difficulty with transportation to different places because- You use the they, phrase compliance. What does that phrase mean? What do you mean by compliance? Well, compliance is when the patients go to look for uh, medical care, basically after being examined and basically prescribed medications or, 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 or basically are being ordered some tests, the patients follow that. And, and these, pe these people have problem with transportation in the area. And then some of them, they don't know how to drive or they require basically their children that most of them, they're working. 
to be transported from one facility to another facility. That made more difficult. That's the reason when I open, I, I try to decide to open, you know, a multi-service, you know, clinic in which allow to to provide these patients care immediately if necessary, or at least avoid basically then being transported from one to another, in which basically will delay basically diagnosis and treatment sometimes. And use the phrase multi-service. Are you familiar with the phrase called multidisciplinary? And if yeah, so, multidisciplinary. Yeah, I'm familiar. What does that mean? Well, the, the multidisciplinary means that they have multiple disciplines. In this case, we, we have radiology services. Then we have a mm -hmm. physical a, a therapy services, and we have sleep medicine services. You know, we also have we also have had some counseling, mental health counseling, especially because of this crisis that we have since the pandemic has been increased. But we have provided through counselors. What are the or, or what are the different divisions uh, or disciplines within the practice of MOAB? Sorry, can you ask me the what question? Are the, what are the different departments and or disciplines that exist within MOAB? Well, it had, been exist, it had been existed in general medicine, additional medicine, late and very lately. And then radiology department, physical therapy department, and sleep medicine department that we close the sleep medicine department because of the lack of employees, you know, at this time. Okay, because so just to be clear, then there's four that you described. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah there, there used to be four. Now we're down to three. Yeah. Okay. The three that exist are internal medicine. Is that correct? Internal medicine and addiction medicine. Internal and addiction medicine, that's number one. Yes. Number two is the radiology any... department. Okay. And number three is physical therapy department. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And okay. Um... Internal medicine, addiction medicine, and what? Radiology department. Radiology. And, and, phys phys and physical therapy department. Thank you. You're welcome. You may proceed. Mm. And um, I th I'm sorry if I asked you this before, but where where is your practice located? My practice is located in Brownsville, Texas, basically on the border with Mexico, you know. Um, Are you familiar with the term under medically underserved area? Yes, and basically it's an area that in which there is a lack of or, or, or almost, almost lack of a medical services in in the area mm -hmm. in which obviously the morbidity and mortality are higher than other places than in the metropolitan areas like Houston's Austin San Antonio or Dallas you know in which there are more concentration of doctors and the healthcare service is more crowded service mm -hmm. right is Brownsville located in a medically underserved area that's correct Tell us a little bit about the your reputation and the reputation of your practice, as far as you know, within the South Texas, the valley where you're located. Yeah, um, we have basically uh, a high reputation. We have patients that have been following for the last 25 years or, or 15 years or 10 years, you know, and we get basically new patients, sometimes five patients a week, new patients a week, or sometimes 10 patients, new patients a week. Our reputation has been solid and basically. What is the geographic area that your patients come from? Most of them are from Brownville and the surroundings areas, most of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is and sometimes also in addiction medicine, I have a I have people coming from Austin, Dallas, Houston, and Laredo, San Antonio, because addiction medicine also nationwide is very small, basically. Yeah, we I, I have seen patients from different places of Texas as well. Do you know approximately how many patients are treated on a, a daily, weekly, or monthly basis? Um, can you give us an idea about the volume of patients that MOAB treats on a regular basis? Around maybe 25 to 30 patients a day. Mm -hmm. Okay, every day? Yeah, Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. And also, during the weekends I work, because I work with addiction patients, addiction medicine patients, 
as well I work during the weekend and also with the hospital patients I work. But office wise is basically Monday to Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and sometimes holidays I, I work. I work as well. So my, my holidays is only when I go on vacation out of town. And is how important is your reputation, the reputation of MOAB to you? It's very important. I have been working very hard to gain the reputation for the basically for 25 years. And um, basically, and it is basically is for us. Basically, it is it, kind of it, it's very hard to be tainted, tainted, you know, with, with accusations that seems to me not very accurate, you know. But and, and because nothing had to do with a patient care directly, indirectly, you know, regarding diagnosis, basically treatment or 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 dispense of medications, you know, according to definition of a practice, medicine practice in Texas, in, in, in the state of Texas. All right. So the um, er, a moment ago, we were discussing the departments at MOAB, and we confirmed that there's the physical therapy, um, internal medicine, and imaging, correct? That's correct. All right. Now, what is your involvement? Can you describe to the court what your involvement is in the physical therapy department? Look, my involvement with the radiology, with, with radiology and physical therapy department is I make sure that each department basically have the resources needed to fully basically uh, operate, you know, optimally. That's my that's the only thing. Like physical therapy wise, I am I don't have any degree in physical therapies, but I have a uh, raised to physical therapy, we're responsible for the department. In the radiology department also, I, I, I have a radiologist who is in charge of the radiology department as well, basically, and basically who is, basically who, who has their tags. All the tags are basically, ha, basically, all the ha, ha, basically have registered except for this MAMO tag, that, the, the tags I make over basically was not registered MAMO, but all the tags have been registered and basically, and they are responsible for their department, you know, what I mean? because this is beyond my my expertise. I'm a scope, I internal medicine physician by the techs and the radiologists they have been running. And I have my the office manager who helps to run the part, but I have been available to them, you know. All right. So, so can you just, I think I understand what you said, but can you, so internal medicine, what is your involvement in the internal medicine department and how does that compare? to your involvement in physical therapy and imaging? The, my involvement in internal medicine department is almost 100% because I am basically in direct contact with, with the nurse on the MAs and with the patient care. I mean, and with the patient directly because I basically interview the patient, examine the patients, diagnose the patient and treat the patient. Okay. And um, let me ask you this, what is the purpose of setting up, or let me ask, or let me rephrase my question, I apologize. Um, what are the advantages of having a multiple, multiple disciplinary practice such as yourselves that has not only internal medicine, but also imaging and physical therapy? What, what's the advantage to having those other departments? To your uh, it's very crucial, you know, in an underserved area and also very crucial in elderly people populations. Because they don't, they they are not very independent. They depend on their family for transportation, and sometimes it's very difficult for them to move from one place to another for different tests. And sometimes, if if I have not provided this type of service, the patient will be ended going to two, 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 three, four different places instead of having the diagnosis in in basically in in two hours or three hours or one day at the most. Basically, it would take several days and weeks, and sometimes the patients get lost, you know, because they, they don't return and it's kind of hard to get so, tracked. Let me ask you a very specific question. And that is, what is the advantage in having an imaging department under one roof, part of your multidisciplinary practice? Please tell the court. The advantage is that allows me basically to diagnose immediately or in short period of time. So I can provide basically adequate adequate and and timely appropriate treatment to the patient therefore there will be less chances of having complications 
from the disease. Also, you know what I mean? And in that way also, short term or long term, basically the mortality uh, will basically decrease, especially in the long way. Yeah. So let me, do you have a, you have an MRI in your uh, imaging department, correct? Yes. What is the advantage of having an MRI machine in the imaging department under one roof at MOAB? Give, give us a concrete example. Well, I can give you an example. Somebody who has basically stroke like symptoms, okay? Okay, oh, oh, no clear about that. You know what I mean? I, we can do an MRI and the MRI basically can tell me yes or not. And it basically takes only basically 20 minutes, 30 minutes to make a diagnosis, you know? Or, uh, or somebody basically uh, have some, uh, you know, a bad pain or fracture sometimes, you know what I mean? And basically compromise on the nerve and having him for, for basically for certain period of time, for, for a few days. Mm -hmm. The MRI allow us to do diagnosis of basically intra-abdominal, intra-pelvic organs, you know, like, you know, and, and also allow us to look, to look at uh, the central nervous system involvement of diseases, you know, that, that can happen. Also that is the, the spine, the cervical spine, the lum thoracic spine, lumbar spine, or extremities. You know. Okay, so let me ask you now: Do you have a CT uh, machine in that imaging department? That's that's correct. What does that machine do? The machine also analyzes intra-abdominal, intra-pelvic organs, also the brain, especially where it was suspecting a bleeding. The best uh, test to be done is a CT, and it, it takes only a minute, five minutes, or less than five minutes to find out if it's bleeding or not bleeding, or at least grossly bleeding. You know. Okay. And what about? You have an X-ray machine in there. Yes, correct. What is that used for? The same thing we have seen basically elderly people coming in which elderly people are very fragile because sometimes they can have osteoporosis and sometimes with move with basically with minimal movement or, or no abrupt movements they can end up having fracture fra basically fractures on the hip especially and that basically we need an X-ray to make a diagnosis. We cannot with exam with exam we cannot do that and okay. that basically not having an imaging facility right me in your hand is going to basically the de the de uh, basically delay a uh, basically treatment and, and will be bad basically worse bad results you know and th that that's going to happen you mentioned the term compliance earlier today remember that yes what can you tell the court how not having these imaging services available under one roof, how does that affect compliance? And is that a bad thing? It, it's a very bad thing because as I said, most of my patients are elderly. They don't know how to drive. They're being basically driven by somebody else or, or sometimes for the uh, grandson, granddaughter. And basically, and sometimes they have only one car and they share with a family. And sometimes they, avoid coming to the doctor sometimes and more, more or less to go to different places because uh, they're very limited in, res in, in resources. Okay, so we've talked about uh, CT, X-ray. Oh, what's a fibro scan? Fibro scan basically is, is a scan that allows me to measure fat tissue in the liver and also scar tissue in the liver. Is That's that, very is important. That it's very high. Prevalent heat fat tissue in, in 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 the valley is very high. It's, I mean, just due to diabetes, obesity, hyperlipidemia, there's the risk factors for basically fat tissue in the liver, and okay. some of them they can end in cirrhosis. <laughs> What's an ultrasound machine, and do you have one in the imaging department? Yes, an ultrasound machine is a machine that basically allows you basically to detect some vascular structures, sometimes soft tissue structures. Also, intra-abdominal and intra-pelvic organs, you know, as well, you know, and also, you know, in, in breast, also lesions, also masses. The ultrasound is being all, on, on top of the mammogram. Okay, so to the now, you remember the survey by DSHS that surveyed the radiology department, right? That's correct. And uh, that was done by the Texas State Health Services, correct? That's correct. All righty, and uh, to your recollection or to your knowledge. Did the state Department of State Health Services find any deficiencies with respect to the machines we've just described and discussed? 
Objection, no, no. Your Honor. Uh, I this is getting into the record evidence. Uh, he can testify about alleged irreparable harm, but the court's review in this case is limited to the administrative record and testimony that goes beyond that, I think is improper. Well, this, Your Honor, this is going directly to the record. Because the, in the, the administrative, you can't what stop. Was, what was, hold on, it's my turn. The record that we're, that Mr. Ross is referring to includes findings by the De Department of State Health Services. And that's that's what I'm talking about here, the findings by the Department of State Health Services. And that's in the record for the court to consider. He, uh, Mr. Uh, Rivas is trying to supplement that by testimony in a TI hearing. The court can review the record, review the findings, and decide for itself. A, a witness can't come in after the fact and give his or her interpretation of that. That's outside the administrative record, and it's improper under the APA. Well, I'm not asking him for to get an impression. I'm just simply asking, was there a violation found? And, and same objection for the same reasons. How would that be subject to interpretation? Well, it, it's they, opinion. It's opinion evidence that goes beyond what the fact finder. He's not the fact finder, Your Honor. The administrative law judge, judges, were the fact finders. And, and Your Honor, my client can certainly talk about the fact. He it certainly has knowledge of the facts. I mean, he paid. Uh, he paid a penalty. I mean, he went to this whole survey. And again, so, that was at SOA. That was the purpose of the contested case hearing, hearings at SOA. That's where you take that evidence. Then it goes into the record, and then the court's review is limited to the record. Okay, so we're that's petitioner's exhibit seven. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Petitioner's no. exhibit seven. We're not talking about position. That, that's the NPDB report. Your okay. Honor. I'm because talking I've about been... the final orders and the findings of fact. Okay. All right. Okay. That's where I got confused. Okay. So fine. So we're not going to let the doctor testify about his belief of what the order of the SOA judge means. I think that's improper, Your Honor. It's opinion testimony. And it, it's outside the record. Well, okay. Um, Mr. Rivas, your response to that? Well, the um, the exhibit, there's an exhibit number five, there's an exhibit plaintiff's five that's in the record. And this is the medical, um, the, the, the order by the medical board. So, okay. So the Your Honor, and this, and let me, I'll tell you what, I'll go about it a different way. If we, if we want to do it the hard way, I'll do it that way. I'll have the doctor go through the order that's in in evidence, and I'll ask him to review the whole order and ask him were there findings other than what I've just described. We can do it that way if you want. And that's even more that's improper. A waste of time. That's an even more improper. That is, that is, again, a listening testimony about a document. Yes, the, the exhibit is in the record, but it's for the court to determine whether that's supported by substantial evidence, which is garnered at the contested case level hearing. A, a, a physician can't come in after the fact and then test, testify for to, to uh, testify and supplement the record effectively with his or her opinion about it. That's that's entirely improper. That goes way beyond okay. the record in the APA. The respondent's objection is sustained. Next question. And Your Honor, may I clarify for the record? Uh, did you mean defendant or? Uh, on... I'm sorry. Um, Just to be clear. Yes, I thought it was petitioner and respondent, but I guess not, but. Mr. Ross, your objection is sustained. Thank you, Your Honor. Does that make it more clear? Yes, ma'am. And should we respond, uh, refer to Dr. Guevara as defendant? He's the plaintiff, Your Honor. Okay. In, in I'm the sorry, it's usually the review. other way around. 
So I'm right. very, very sorry. Right. Yeah, okay. it, it is flipped. You yes. may proceed, right. uh, Mr. Revis. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Ah! Been a crazy week. The, um, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. So the um, you, you're what was your what is a radiation safety officer, Doctor Guevara? Sorry, are you what, talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Doctor Guevara. What is a radiation safety officer? A radiation safety officer is an officer who is responsible, basically, of the. Uh, Compliance other other radiation uh, services in the mammogram. Make sure basically that 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 the machine allow us to provide radiation. Alara is as low as re reasonable shippable, mm -hmm. and also make sure that basically that uh, we follow uh, uh, the protocols mm -hmm. of. Uh, we we follow the 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 protocols of of the radiation. Uh, make sure that we have also um, a batch in which monitor basically the, the radiation of the each employee. You know, and basically, and not, I don't want to hear basically. I don't want to hear basically. Okay. That's not hey. what I want to hear. And 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 also is in contact with a radiologist. And also is in contact with the with the with, with the physicist for uh, for the physicist to examine the machine and is basically is providing the minimum radiation with with an optimal pictures. Okay, and the um, uh, Dr. Guevara, are you familiar with the term practicing medicine? Are you familiar with that term? Yes. Okay, and um, just first, you know, for for the record. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like the court to take a judicial notice of Texas Occupation Code 151.002, little a, 13. Uh, this is the uh, definition of the practice of medicine found in the Occupations Code. And um, just for the benefit of the court and for the record, um, that statute states that practicing medicine means the diagnosis, treatment, offer to treat a mental or physical disease or disorder or physical deformity or injury by any system or method, or the attempt to affect cures of those conditions by a person who public, publicly professes to be a physician or is directly or, or indirectly charging money or their compensation for those services. So Dr. Guevara, the, um, does the, does the, do the duties of an RSO involve the practice of medicine? Absolutely not. It's only yes, it's an, it's an administrative position. The job basically of the RSO is to ensure that the equipment doesn't admit, admit, admit enough radiation to the patient and the patient. I'm going to have to assert the same objection as I did before, Your Honor. This isn't about irreparable harm. It's opinion testimony attempted to be solicited about evidence that's that is about that is not in the record. Response. Counsel at the, at the SOA proceedings, the contested case proceedings, could have asked him this question or any of these questions, but he can't bring in evidence through a TI hearing afterwards to try Your to Honor, do that. Your Honor, this goes to the likelihood, likelihood of success issue, and it's important because the likelihood of success is a critical. I am allowed. I my our position is that we are allowed to offer testimony about the likelihood of success and. At one of the core issues that we're talking about here is was the role of the RSO connected to the practice of medicine, and so that so we would submit that this line of questioning is relevant to the likelihood of success element that we are, we need to prove. Reply. <laughs> Your Honor, the likelihood of success is determined by the, the administrative record. The council can argue about it. They can argue about what's in the administrative record, but you can't bring in testimony after the fact. That's 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 the point that 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 I'm trying to make here. You know, likelihood of success. You look at the record. The court 
applies the substantial evidence rule, can't reweigh the evidence, you know, all of the deference that's afforded, all those things that go into the substantial evidence standard or review, but it has to do it on the administrative record that we have, not on subsequent testimony. And how would the uh, Dr. Guevara's answer to that question go outside the record? It was just wasn't asked to him in, in the SOA hearing? I don't know, Your Honor. I don't know whether it's asked or not. The point is it could have been. It could have been asked. They had the opportunity to ask him about that at the SOA hearing. So whether or not it was asked, they had the opportunity to do that. Okay, the objection sustained. Next question, please. Well, Your Honor, the, the we have we have our our burden is to pr prove the likelihood of success at hearing, and so we have the we should have the opportunity to put on evidence that highlights why we believe we're going to be successful. I mean, otherwise, why bother with it? Just I mean, we can just look at the record and I mean, but here we have we're asking for the court to hold off on to stay that the enforcement of that order. And in order to do that, we have to show the court that we're likely to win. And so the um, the quest, the critical question here is, was there sufficient evidence to show that Dr. Guevara's role as the RSO was connected to the medical practice, was connected to the practice of medicine? And so. All we're trying, all we're highlighting is the fact that it was not connected to the fan, to the practice of medicine because the practice of medicine is as we just discussed. And your honor, again, it's it's evidence outside the record being brought in to 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 try to determine that. That's what's improper. Counsel can argue from the record whether or not there's evidence in the record that it was connected to the practice of medicine, but can't come in afterwards and have another contested case hearing, essentially. And it's not a, the, these these TI hearings that my experience, Your Honor, if you don't have if, if you're not going to put on tep evidence of irreparable harm, which is proper, then you argue from the record. And you can't you can't supplement it by more testimony outside the record. Well, and it's like you can't show up at an oral argument in one of the courts of appeals and start getting new evidence there. Right. Like call a witness or something. Right. So uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a break and we will be back at 2.45. We're in recess until 2.45. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Here's some of what I found with a quick Google search while we're taking a break. The Medical Associates of Brownsville is a comprehensive primary care physician group. Uh, Dr. Guevara opened it. It says he's been practicing in Brownsville since 1996, and he opened this clinic in 2004. Like I said, comprehensive primary care where they do the testing on site as well, making it a high-tech facility. These are some of the conditions that they treat and also diagnose on site because of the testing that they have available, which is, you know, pretty similar to most primary cares. They also have their values listed on this site, which I thought was interesting. But a little bit more interesting than that was some of the complaints that I found. Um, Dr. Guevara's rating is a 1.5 with 28 reviews on healthgrades.com. However, I was not able to actually pull up the healthgrades report because it had been deleted. I believe that's going to be because he no longer has a medical license, but I'm not sure. So I looked at some of the other sites that actually allow you to leave reviews for doctors, and this is like comprehensive. This isn't just me cherry picking reviews. Um, this one from 2017, I wouldn't even give him one star. And it goes on to talk about how her father had a stroke and he made them sit there for an hour, which everybody knows time is critical in strokes. You have to get the stroke, the clot buster drug in within a couple of hours. So the, he finally sent him to the ER and they requested another doctor. And the other doctor told him that 
Dr. Guevara did them a disservice because her father ultimately died because by the time they got there to treat him, it was too late. The next one, do not go to this doctor. He obviously doesn't care about his patients. He doesn't even make you feel like a human being. I think most of us have gone to doctors where you feel like you're just a number in the assembly line. I'm extremely disappointed in this facility, 2019. But then in another in 2019, I'm 55 and he's the best I ever had. I live 450 miles from him today and I still go back for checkups. Wow, that's a long way to go for a doctor. I mean, I don't care if they're the best in the world. That's a long way to go for a doctor. Um, my mother-in-law sustained a fall, was seen by Dr. Guevara, and did not notify me until the next day that she had a fracture. And that one's actually in there twice. And then please let me know, because, you know, some people just don't know how to do it. Um, here's a Muy Bien Doctor, 2019. Image Center is the best in Brownville, Brownsville. And then 2018. This doctor is more interested in making money than caring for the patients. He did a brain scan when all I had was a common cold. He screams at his staff and keeps calling people that owe him money when he was in the hallway. I had to wait two hours for a CT scan technician. They put you in a supply room and insert the catheter while you put your arm over a box of gloves. Okay. I'm not even touching that one. Refuses to look at me. He bent over his computer typing. If he talks, you can't understand him as he usually has one hand over his mouth. He orders every test you can think of. I felt I was double billed for terrible service. This is the second time I visited this doctor. When he walked in the room where I was waiting for him, he was talking on his cell phone, sat down while on the phone, typed on the computer, told me I was fine, and got on his phone again. So that's just what I was able to find. There's a couple good reviews, though. Yeah. All right. You may proceed, Mr. Rebus. Thank you. Uh, so, Your Honor, um, I'm with respect to the government code 2001-174, this is the section entitled review under substantial evidence. Um, that statute states that, uh, the, that a judge has the ability on appeal uh, to reverse remand the case for further proceedings if the substantial rights of an appellant have been prejudiced because the administrative findings are a in violation of a constitutional or statutory provision and b in excess of the agency's statutory authority so what we what our our position in our theory of the case is this is that and this is what we pled is that the board exceeded their statutory authority by preventing our client from uh, owning an imaging facility. They don't have the authority to do that. The other, uh, in addition to that, the board um, made, uh, or pre is preventing, the board's order is preventing the um, operation and ownership of various types of imaging uh, equipment, not just mammography. And so the uh, the fact that the my client uh, and or received an order preventing him from operating these certain types of, equ of equipment, which was never pled or never issued, and there's no evidence about this, about any issues with any of the other evidence, um, is an is a violation of his constitutional rights of due process because he was never put on. You know, while he is prevented from operating these machines, these other machines, he was never put on notice, and there was never never any evidence. Um, didn't have an opportunity to be heard, didn't have the right to contest um, any uh, any evidence, because there wasn't any, of violations or, or issues with all this other imaging equipment that he's now being prevented from utilizing. And so one other thing, too, is one of the critical issues in, in this case is um, the, can, the board is, has made a decision that my client's role as an RSO uh, is somehow um, practicing medicine or, or connected to the practice of medicine. And our, it, you know, our position is that the board, that the practice or that, uh, that the role of an RSO is not regulated by the Texas Medical Board, number one, um, and, number, and therefore the board cannot, uh, is going beyond their authority 
in sanction in, in sanctioning Dr. Guevara for his role as an RSO when it's clear that an RSO is not the practice of medicine. And so we that is why I believe it is we have the right to offer testimony as to what is an RSO, what is the practice of medicine, and we're going to we have a likelihood of success because practicing as an RSO is not practicing medicine. And so and and so when you and also one other thing too, your honor with respect to section a violation of a constitutional provision, B, in excess of this agency's statutory authority. You're not gonna, you're, you're number one, we, we argued that in motion practice, but you know, we're not, sorry, doc, I need to, my phone's connected to my computer. Okay. All right. Uh, anyway, the um, uh, because we because this is what a judge can make a decision on violation of constitutional authority in excess of agency statutory authority. These are this is what we pled, and the L, one of the 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 one of the most important elements is that the we have the we have the burden to prove that we have a likelihood of success. And so that is why I'm I'm offering this evidence because this evidence supports that we have a likelihood of success. And moreover, you're not you're not going to fund the, the administrative record um there in the hearing, you're you're not gonna I'm not sure how you're gonna find or how anybody would ever um what evidence there would show to so uh via or, or you know, the the agency acting beyond their statutory authority or violating their constitute my client's constitutional due process. Your Honor, none of that addresses or refutes the fact that the court's review and substantial evidence is limited to the agency record, which has been prepared and certified and filed. And Mr. Uh, Lau or Mr. Rivas, they can argue all day long if they want to from the record. That's their right to do. But the APA clearly provides that the eight, the court's review is limited to the agency record. And Dr. Guevara's testimony is not part of the agency record. He's coming in after the fact and offering his opinion and trying to get more evidence in that's not the court's role. You can't do that unless it's a de novo review, and that's not the standard here. And as an aside, <laughs> to suggest that uh, radiology is not connected to the practice of medicine, we can we can we can argue this uh, at at the uh, in all of these things at the hearing uh, on the merits in this case. But I, I think that's I think that is just flat wrong. But these things are for the hearing on the merits where the court looks at the record to determine likelihood of success on the merits in a TI hearing is no different. The court has to look at the record and okay. the record is the agency record. Okay. I mean, if, if Dr. Wabowski I've already sustained it multiple times. I don't know okay. why we're going on and on and on about this. So I, I, I appreciate that. Okay. Honor. Cause we're running this. out of time. I'm, yeah. Duty this week. I have two emergencies waiting in the wings, and I intend on stopping at the two hour mark. What other questions do you have for your client, Mr. Rivas, please? Okay, Your Honor. Uh, may I proceed? Yes. Um, Dr. Guevara, I'm going to refer you to um, Plaintiff's Exhibit Five. Can you get, can you go to that document, that Exhibit Number Five? It's the um, order in this case, the TMB order. Do you have that handy? 
And I think you might be on mute. Yeah. Dr. Vera here talking, you're on mute. Unmute. Okay, sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Um, I'm directing your attention to exhibit number five. Mm -hmm. Can you find that? Yes. I, I just open exhibit number five. Yes. Okay, this is the exhibit number five is the, uh, at the top it says Texas Medical Board v. Guevara. Do you see that? Mm. Yes. Okay, all right. So I'm going to ask you a question about this. This is the, um, this is the order, right, that the board issued against you, correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to direct your attention to page eight of 13. Can you go to that page where it says mm -hmm. order at the bottom? Page, yeah, I, I, I know page eight of 13, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and it says, are you at the second where it says order? You see that? Yes. And then do you see paragraph one that begins at the bottom? And then finishes the the on the next page. It, you see where it states that the TMB is ordering you that you shall not own, own, yes, operate as a radiation safety officer, um, as a medical director, or otherwise be associated with any imaging, including a program performs mammography and any facility where imaging studies, including but not limited to mammograms, are performed or interpreted. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, phrase. Now, how how will that phrase, how will that um, section of the order affect your practice? Well, tremendously, because I will have to shut down basically the whole radiology department. I will have to get rid of all the employees of the radiology department. Uh, basically, and as I said before, the compliance of my patients, especially early people, uh, 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 and basically with low income will be suffer. Okay, all right. And then um, I'm gonna ask you to go back to page two of 13. Okay. Let me know when you're there. I am there. Mm -hmm. And here, these are the findings of fact that um, the back up, that the judge found, that the judge in the DSHS case found, correct? I, I believe so. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, go on to, uh, go to page five of 13, paragraph nine, do you see that? 513, yes, uh-huh. Okay, all right. And then the, um, these were the violations that the um, board, of, the medical board relied upon in their case. Is that correct? Objection, your honor. And it's the same objection. And that's why we're, I think, losing a lot of time Stained. in this matter. He can't testify about the findings. Sustained. Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the if the uh, order as written um, stayed in place right now. You said you. Uh, what would happen to the employees? Well, they we I will have to let them go because basically the whole regular department will be shut down, and my patients basically will suffer because it basically allow us to delay 
the diagnosis and treatment of these patients. I will have to basically send the patient to the emergency room. So the cost of healthcare of these patients will skyrocket. And basically, and at the end, you know, in, in, uh, complications and more and morbidity will increase and maybe mortality, you know what I mean? But uh, at least complications will, will increase. So I, I just to be to play on the safe side, I would have basically to be more conservative with this patient and uh, and include also social issues that I will allow me for the patients to be admitted to the hospital just yeah, for the safety of them. All right. And, okay. And then what is how important are insurance contracts, commercial insurance contracts to your medical practice? Oh, was is the insurance contract, especially for Medicare and Medicaid are 80%. Okay. And um, the um, what is the, uh, are you enrolled or were you enrolled with Molina, BCBS, and Cigna? Yes. Okay. Why is that important? Yeah, important because a very high percentage of these patients are in the desert area and most of them are have Medicare HMO, Medicare HMO, and basically, and they're very limited, you know, in, in, in terms of resources okay so what medical is the, resources um how has the board's order affected the your relationship with these commercial care with these managed care insurance companies uh, well i mean is has had basically uh, is completely you know a detrimental basically to to my patient but also to the practice as well because I had been called that basically that I had been danger basically I I immediate threat to the public. And I, I kind of try to find myself how about double board certify and a physician who had been doing medical missions is <laughs> is immediate threat to the public, uh, you know, for some administrative issues that happen in, in the in the radiology department in which I don't have the scope to make images, to produce images, or to read images, interpret images. I am not a radiologist. This is beyond my scope. So I, let me, I, let me, all right, so let me ask, so these commercial insurance contracts, um, what would the effect be of the loss of these contracts? Well, basically put at risk my patients and also put at risk a medical center in Brownsville at risk of closing the facility because will be a tremendous impact. As I say, 80% of this population basically are under Medicaid HMOs and Medicare HMOs mm -hmm. in Brownville because it's a, it's a poorly income and reserve area. Mm -hmm. So if we, um, um, once we get through this whole process of this hearing, uh, of this appeal that we have before the court, um, what's the problem with, once we prevail, hopefully, what would be the problem? Can't you just get these contracts back? Mm, I I found very impossible or very hard. It will cause irreparable damage. Basically, it, it will cause some definitely damage to my patients because some of them are the people that have been taken care of for 25, 20, 20 years or 15 years. And basically, and they have very, basically problem with transportation you know, limitations because they depend on their on their children. Sometimes their children are working as well, so they're very limited. And sometimes what has been helping a lot has been tele, telemedicine, you know, with these patients, obviously. But, um, and definitely to the practice, basically, will cause damage at risk of closing the facility. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the Exhibit 6 in front of you? Okay, open. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, that Medicare, HMOs, and Medicare HMOs have been calling my billing manager about what's going on and what is the TRO, basically, just to, they're waiting for, for this, for this outcome, really, to, to make a determination. Mm -hmm. Are you at, are you, do you see exhibit six in front of you? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a, go to the second page. There's a letter from Blue Cross on the second page. Yes. Right, 
Okay. Yes. And then on the third page, there's a letter from Cigna. Is that correct? Mm, that's correct. Yes, that's correct. All right. Okay. What these let what what are these letters telling you? Well, in Blue Curve Shield, basically, they they, they basically gonna they're gonna terminate you know effectively by January 9, 2024 and blue advantage him over April 8, 2024 unless I appeal you know what I mean uh, but they have given me basically termination notice and um, why the are they seeking to terminate you why because in one of the national data bank initial actions basically they say that I am immediate threat to the public so when immediate threat to the public it means that I am immediate threat to my patients and also these patients are members of the HMO and basically and they will and that will they have to find a reason to terminate it because if I am a threat to the public and including to my patient also I'm, I'm gonna be in a threat to the members of the Medicare right, so, Medicare HMOs. So then look on the second page the letter from Blue Cross. Um, do you see that first line where it talks about Blue Cross Blue Shield recently obtained information? Do you see that? Yes. And um, what are they referring to there? To the Texas Medical Board reported on August 2023, the okay. agreed order. Now, go to the next page, the one from Cigna. And do you see uh, on the second paragraph, do you see the reference to the Medical Board and national and or National Practitioners Data Bank Report? Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So what is the basis for Cigna seeking to terminate your provider agreement? And your honor, I'm sorry to interrupt. If we're going to end at uh, 3.30, I have cross-examination of, of Dr. Guevara and we'd like to make a closing argument. And, and it's looking like that we're already like prejudicing that ability uh, through the extensive uh, direct testimony. I, I have some cross questions. And if the court's going to end at 3.30, okay, I just wanted to bring that to the court's up. attention. Okay. So you didn't have an objection to this particular question then? That's correct, Your Honor, no okay. objection. You do not? I do not. Okay, so no, Mr. Do uh, Dr. Guevara may answer it and then let's give us some of our, you know, let's one or two more questions after that. Okay. Do you need to ask the question Dr. again? Dr. Guevara? What's the basis for uh, Cigna terminate, seeking to terminate your provider agreement? Basically, is in, in, in response to an inquiry to the Texas State Me Medical Board and, and or National the National Practitioner Data Bank report, the adverse actions on my license. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Thank you. Th thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Doctor. W good afternoon. Um, do you own MAB? Sorry, what was your question? Do you own MAB? I uh, well, I own the 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 the, the, the professional association MAB. Yes, I own. That's correct. Okay, and you receive net income from the components of the practice of MAB, right? I receive a salary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I think you testified what those components are. Uh, how many employees uh, are, and, and how many employees are uh, employed by MAB, and how are they distributed across what I guess we now have the three divisions? Yeah, around maybe twenty-five to thirty employees, maybe more or less around that. You get it. And. Um, I want to call your attention, sir, to uh, the statement that you made in uh, your petition that's on file in this case. Are you familiar with the petition? No, but you can basically, I can review it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm quoting from it. Counsel can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but in all, you say, in all probability, plaintiff's medical practice will be crippled. Furthermore, plaintiff will be forced to terminate a number of key employees and the patient would be deprived of the benefits of continued treatment. And then you go on to say, due to the makeup of the local communities, it is unlikely that Dr. Guevara's patients will be able to find an appropriate alternative provider for their radiological needs. Does that sound right? Sir, I didn't, I didn't get it. Can you say okay. it again, please? All right. 
you're going to have to read slower also. I'm sorry, Your Honor. It's it's not, you know, it's just people think that it's magic um, how sure. reporters can write down things. And when we read, we tend to read more quickly because we feel like we want to save time. But if you want a good record, just go ahead and ask the question again. Okay. Do it a little I, I, I apologize, Your Honor. That's okay. And, to, to shorten things in your petition, uh, sir, you say your medical practice if, if is going to be crippled and you'll have to terminate a number of key employees. And my, is, does that sound right? That's what you're saying? I just said a few minutes ago. That's, that's correct. What specific evidence do you have that that would happen if just the, ra the radiological arm of your uh, practice would be affected? Well, first of all, we have eight employees in the radiology services. They will be basically uh, terminate or basically let them go because basically the Texas Medical Board is asking me to shut down completely the, the imaging department is one. Okay, second is, as you just basically saw, we have basically many a letters from Medicare, Medicaid, HMOs, in which basically Brokovichil is one of the heavy, basically Medicare HMOs in 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 the in the valley, right now, in which basically will terminate us completely, well, completely, not only from providing imaging service, you know, for from basically uh, seeing the patient for other for my medical services or for other services that we can have like labs, EKG, or any other services, or spirometer, pulmonary function tests. All, all of that will be deprived, basically, uh, because all these patients will be switched to, I guess, will go somewhere or we will be able to find, you know, maybe a doctor, because as, as I said, we're in a shorter area and underserved area. You Are you I mean? the only physician? in uh, Brownsville? That, no, I am not the only physician. I, that's not my question, sir. I wasn't finished. Oh, sorry. My question so, sorry. Is, are you saying that you're the only physician in Brownsville that has a radiological service that serves underserved uh, persons, patients? Are you saying you're the only one, MAB? I don't know, but I may, they may be some x-ray. I don't know if other physicians on different imaging service, I don't know. There know. are a number of other imaging service locations in, in uh, uh, Brownsville. Uh, yeah, I know. But to make an appointment for these patients, as you just mentioned carefully, it takes a while. And how do you and know that? that? These patients have problems with transportation, as I mentioned. They are poor income. That they, they, elderly people, 90, 95 years old, 85 years old, that they, don't, they, they cannot drive and they depend on their grandchildren or their children. So most of the children are working, so they have difficulty moving from place to place. What evidence do you have that it would take longer for them to get images? Well, <laughs> the evidence is in the mammogram have been taking months to get because the hospital is booked completely, and and sometimes they miss their appointment appointments in 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 a seventy year old sixty year old because they don't have their own transportation. Even a younger people people like fifty years old. They don't have the transportation they're paying other people. It takes whatever it, it, it can take much much shorter. Now it takes longer. And sometimes they miss their appointment. And you would want your patients to, you would want your patients, no matter where the imaging services are provided, you would want them to have those services provided by qualified personnel, even if they had to go somewhere else, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, so yeah. if the choice if the choice is to go someplace where there's not qualified personnel or to have to find transportation to go to, to one of the other ones, you would want them to be able to go to one of the other imaging centers, wouldn't no, you? No, I mean, it has to go to a qualified place. Okay. I mean, that's okay. not about that. I mean, Thank you. Not about that. And, and, and um, who, uh, who, who works currently in the imaging department and, and what, what are their qualifications at MAB? How many employees? What do they do? And what are their qualifications? Okay, we have an, an, an X-ray tech. Okay, we have an ultrasound tech. Mm -hmm. We have an MRI tech and a, and, and a CT tech. And who supervises them? 
the radiologist supervising. And so you have you're the ra that's you the radiologist. No, you're also uh, no. So yeah, are you talking yeah, about who is the radiologist? No, I am not a radiologist. I don't read. What my question, sir, was who supervises them currently? We basically the radiologist supervising the images. Okay, we have an RSO. The RSO in this case because he's an X-ray tech. He supervise not as an RSO, you know, as an X-ray tech, CT tech, and and he's he's an also MRI tech. He also su to supervise that, mm -hmm. and the and radiologist. It, and, and is it Mr. Marisol? You said or no? Uh, his name is Ricardo Gonzalez. Okay, and uh, is he licensed? Does he have any kind of license from uh, uh, the uh, medical board or the DEA or any organization like that? Yes, uh, I also have license in the AART as well, the, the federal license. What licenses does he have from the medical board? Uh, as I mentioned, as far as I know, I mean, it does, he has an X-ray li license, has a CT license, an MRI license. Bear with me one second. Mm -hmm. um, back on the uh, on the components uh, of your practice that remain the three components, what percentage of the of, of the salary you get, the services that you provide for which you get a salary, are attributed to each of those three services? You make no. more money off of one of them than than the other, or how how are how are they related in terms of your income? No, I don't, my salary it, it is a fixed salary basically. It is you know, it's a fixed salary. I don't receive basically from this or from that. The the the, the companies there have a fixed salary. At the end of the year, you know, it will be different. But I don't have any salary for each modality. Okay, and and this is a for-profit company, I assume, MAB. Yes, if for profit company, yes. How would their profits then be affected uh, if the imaging services component uh, didn't operate? Definitely, How, no, no. I, in I'm relation looking, to the other two. Okay, I know. Looking only the, I, I know. Looking the profit, as I said. Also, I look at basically compliance, basically of the patients, because as, as I said, that, that's not my question, sir. My question is of the profits that MAB makes. How are they attributed to the three components? Like. What which of them makes more money than the other one? I example, haven't I here? haven't looked at the you, you haven't, haven't looked, looked at that. At okay. No. Um, what imaging services they may be providing right now? I I say X rays, bone densities, DEXAs, ultrasound, fiber scan, and CTs. Uh, any mammographies? No, we we stop when the problem occurs. Okay, uh, and a mammography is an imaging service, isn't it? Is a what? An imaging service. Yeah, mammography is one of the imaging services. We have different imaging services. It's one of them. And you're the radiation safety officer, correct? For MAD? No, I am not radiation safety officer. I, as I say, Ricardo Gonzalez. Okay, Did, have you ever at any time been the radiation safety officer at MAB? I said in 2018 when the problem happened, but then I stopped be, be, becoming an RSO because uh, basically for the same reason. Um, and uh, the gentleman that you mentioned, I'm sorry, did you say his name is Mr. Gonzalez? Ricardo. Ricardo, and, and he's licensed yes. by the board? Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the insurance. Uh, you were talking about loss of insurance coverage, um, and uh, uh, why couldn't you, if, if if you lost coverage for the radiation practice, why couldn't you maintain the insurance, or could you maintain the insurance coverage for the other two divisions? Well, I just got termination letter from the insurance. I don't have control. To keep being enrolled with insurance, it's up to the the, the insurance to, to to basically to continue with them or terminate. It's, it's not up to 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 my to the practice or to me. 
it's, it's up to the insurance. They, they, if you read the letter carefully, if they're sending me the, to see terminated. I'm not asking for that. I mean, it's because of the Texas Medical Report and the National Data Bank, Bank Report. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to call your attention, sir, back to uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 6. Do you see that? Uh, le le let me go. It's the insurance letters from the insurance companies. Okay. Uh, and I want to call your attention to the letter from uh, Molina Healthcare mm -hmm. um, and dated October 18, 2023. And do you see down there in about the middle, it says uh, it, it refers to other items the committee may find helpful in their decision making. And then it has several bullet points. Mm. Oh, I didn't it, mean, OK. It, it, yeah. It, it, yeah. OK. Did you did you provide that information uh, through? I believe that through my attorney, I have provided, uh, I believe. And so through your attorney, you've answered all of those questions for the insurance company. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, I believe so. I, I, I'm not sure that, I mean, but I mean, um, as who has been handling has been my, 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 my billing manager. So basically. Yeah. Well, if this insurance company is asking you questions about your practice. Uh, and yeah, about, okay. They're asking to provide you, narrative you, explanation, any background you feel is important. Okay. And you have learned on how you might prevent any future mm -hmm. reports. <laughs> uh, first of all, this is, I completely disagree. I'm, I'm not that. asking you that. No, hold on. Sir. I'm asking First of all, I completely agree with the, the with the members of the Texas Medical Board. In my case, that this is a medical practice. Basically. Objection, non-responsive. Okay. My question is: Did you answer any of these questions in the Molina letter and provide that information to Molina? Yes, we have we have provided a letter to Molina through my attorney. We have answered to to Molina. Uh, and you've answered all those questions. I, I at least what I basically said is we're going to the TRO and we're appealing the case. That okay, was so you, you didn't answer the question specifically. Uh, I may we may have no answer to this question yet. Okay. And then I'm just going to ask the same question on the Ever North letter. That's the third page, mm -hmm. and uh, there are some similar, not as many questions, but you see down there, there are one, two, three, four bullet pop points did you did you respond to those uh questions uh, we i believe that we respond to them and basically through the attorney that one yeah i believe that okay what what what, what were the responses from the insurance company after you provided the the, the responses that they yeah basically with that we can go to, that we can go to the tro that basically the Tesla medical board order right now is being put on hold and up to, uh, up until today basically and 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 then that we are appealing the case as far as I'm. Well, how is that a response to the specific questions oh we explained that about that intellectual action you we explained and basically that basically our point of view that basically that this was an a an, an RSO issue that basically and this is not the practice the RSO is not physician in, I mean, it doesn't have to be a physician, therefore, is not a, a medical practice, you know what I mean? Okay, so it's a fair statement then that in your response, you were just arguing your position in this litigation and not no, answering well, the questions. What we're doing, let them know that we are going basically to, we have a TRO hearing, okay. and, basically, and we're appealing. I'll take that as your answer. Um, and let's see here, I'm trying to... Um, I'm almost finished, Your Honor. Mm. Uh, you and you're not, uh, you don't do mammographies, I think you testified, right? That's correct. Okay, and I think you testified earlier about an elderly woman not being able to get a mammography done uh, for convenience was at risk. Uh, if wait, you wait, don't wait, do wait. mammographies, no, no, no. how do you know that? 
no, so, sorry. Can you say it again? Sorry. I, I thought you testified earlier that you were referring to elderly people. Uh, if they can't get mammograms, they're going to be at risk. No, what I said is about the 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 the, the full immune services. Um, I was not talking about mammogram. I, I for first of all, mammogram program has been shut down. I'm talking about the other uh, modalities that I was talking about. And uh, mammogram, it's very important that mammograms be accurate, isn't it? Yes, it's important to be accurate. That's correct. Because Just remember, we have been practicing for 20 for, for Objection, 20 Your Honor, non-responsive. My, my question's been answered. Stained. Is, um, Is there anything else you would like to tell the court that you haven't told the court already, sir, about why you believe you would be irreparably harmed if the board enforced uh, the final order? I said in, in, in one of your statements, you mentioned that I basically made a threat to the public. It made a threat to the public means that I made a threat to my patients. And also to, to to the members of the Medicare Medicare HMOs, that would imply. And, it, and, it, and it's important to protect the public and your patients by uh, providing qualified uh, personnel and imaging services and the other services you provide, isn't it? Yeah. The, 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 but, but thank but thank the you, question, Your Honor. I, thank hello, you, Your hello, Honor. Hello, non responsive, hello. Your Honor. Objection. No, no, no. no don't, don't, I haven't I'll finished. pass the witness. Okay, I haven't finished, but that's okay. Thank you. All right. I'm going to give you a few questions on redirect. Mr. Rebus. Can't hear. Oh, I said I I'll give you a few questions on redirect. Oh, I was just signaling that his he was muted. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't see that. Thank you. Dr. You may Guevara. proceed, Mr. Rebus, but we're running out of time. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Guevara, where you this phrase immediate threat to the public, where is that phrase found? Uh, my understanding is I couldn't find uh, basically in the in the final order I couldn't find it. I okay. found on the National Practitioner Data Bank. Okay, and then referring to Exhibit Six, um, I'm directing your attention to the signal letter and the letter from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, do those letters do those letters terminate just certain services or departments within your um, uh, your 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 medical office or the entire medical office. That is going to the entire medical office. All right. Thank you. Pass witness. All right. <clears throat> Do you have any other witnesses to call? No, Your Honor. All right. Does plaintiff petitioner rest? Petitioner rest. All right, Mr. Ross. Uh, Your Honor, we don't have any witnesses, uh, again, because the court's review is limited to the record. Um, and uh, uh, we would like, I, I think, Ms. Johnson and obviously Mr. Lauer, Mr. Rivas would probably want to make a close, quick closing argument. If okay. The will allow that if there's... Very quickly. Closing statements. I think Ms. Johnson goes first or? Yes. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, it's it's the plaintiff, Dr. Guevara's burden of proof. Oh, well, I thought he said, I'm sorry. I thought he was referring to Mr. Lau. Don't we have the last word? I thought, because it's not. Yes, but that's no, a reply. No, Your Honor, they have the burden of proof. They have to go first. Of course. Um. I was really thinking about not granting or uh, closing anyway, <laughs> because that's all that I've heard this whole time is argument. So I think I get it. So Mr. Lau, you may proceed. Jonah, I'll be very brief. Um, <clears throat> um, we believe that we have produced um, solicit evidence um, indicating meeting the elements for a temporary injunction. Uh, number one, um, and there is the, the board order substantiating the sanction was not supported by substantial evidence, um, given that um, the only 
any any finding of violation is between two doctors coverable as an RSO, which is by definition uh, under um, um, the Texas Administrative Code 289, um, that it is 289.252, that is by definition not a medical practice of medicine. Um, the RSO is confined to administrative purposes to ensure the equipment that does not emit um, excessive amount of radiation for the protections of the staff and the patients. Um, so there's really no, so for, for the board to um, sanction Dr. Guevara for his shortcoming as RSO is in, it's in, exceeded um, the TMB's uh, statutory authority um, to only regulate practice of medicine, which is characterized in um, Texas Occupation Code 155.0, um, Secondly, um, as stated by um, Dr. Guevara, as well as finding the administrative uh, records, there has never been any finding by any agency or anybody, whether it's DSHS or, or, or TMB, that Dr. Guevara's practice has any issue pertaining to his x-ray, um, uh, bone scan, fibro scan, ultrasound, CT scan, MRI. However, the order as written right now, the TMB final order, will we shut him from practicing any of that. Um, there has not been notice pertaining to those aspects of his radiology imaging practices. Um, it was never an issue presented in any of those cases. Dr. Guevara was never given any opportunity to be heard on those cases. In fact, the first time that he was aware that he was being restricted on those practices was from the order, uh, from the final commission order by, by the TMB issue on August, 20, August 18, 2023. Um, it is also clear that um, by Dr. Guevara's testimony that if the TI is not granted and the TMB is allowed to enforce this order, um, he would immediately have to shut down his radiology imaging department. Um, then he would have to, again, send away a lot, most of his patients um, that in a, in a historically underserved area, um, his patient population trend toward the elderly and the inf infirm, where they might not have the ability to find alternative um, treatments for radiology studies. Um, and then um, by virtue of the of the NPDB report, there is a substantial um, uh, uh, harm to his business reputations and the fact that he has to close that close down at least a quarter of his practice would affect his um, business reputation in the community or among his patients. Um, there's also specific concerns um, as as shown by as shown by the. Um, Plaintiff exhibit number six uh, that the, the insurance carrier, the MCO um, uh, administering Medicaid, um, that because of the ongoing uh, TMB order, they are going to terminate Dr. Guevara's and MAB's enrollment status, which he would no longer be able to bill across the board for every single department in his practice. And then he would also have to forego those patients as well. So there's um, immediate irreparable harm with respect to the patients. Um, Dr. Guevara has to, would have forced to terminate all his employees uh, that, are, that, are, that are working, that are designated in the radiology department. And then finally, by nature of a judicial review, there is no adequate remedy of law. Um, the agency is protected by sovereign immunity. There is, at the end of this case, there's not going to be any monetary uh, compensation to Dr. Guevara. At this point, if the TI is not granted, Dr. Guevara would have lost his business, lost his patients, uh, lost his insurance in Bowman. And then even if he prevail, ultimately prevailed at, at, at the final hearing on the merit, he would not be able to uh, reconstitute or rebuild his business. Um, in balancing the interests um, to the public and to Dr. Guevara, um, he's facing a tremendous uh, harm to his business and his business reputations. On the other hand, the only finding of any violation was pertaining to mammography, and Dr. Guevara has not been practicing mammography since 2018. Um, and, um, and with respect to the other uh, radiology study that, I, that he said has been practicing for the last five years, there's no evidence that there has any been any finding of fault or any shortcoming or this, this um, deficiency pertaining to those study. So there's no evidence there's any uh, a risk of patient harm um, that would uh, 
way toward um, allowing the, the, the TMB order to be enforced. So in weighting all these, all these um, different factors, uh, we believe you have sustained a burden in, um, for the court to grant a temporary injunctions and to, to keep the case in status quo until the final uh, hearing on the merit. Thank you. All right, much. thank you. Mr. Ross or Ms. Johnson. Yes, I'll keep this brief, Your Honor. Well, the plaintiff, Dr. Guevara, has not shown that he's likely to succeed on the merits of his underlying claim. He was the radiation safety officer at the time that DSHS did its investigation. And under 25 Texas Admin Code 289.226 in 2, that means that he must ensure that all of his personnel are adequately trained, which he did not do. The Texas Medical Board also has the authority to issue its final order under the Medical Practice Act and its disciplinary matrix. The Medical Practice Act specifically allows the Texas Medical Board to restrict a physician's area of practice, and the disciplinary matrix sets out guidelines for when they can do that. The disciplinary matrix specifically allows them to restrict a physician's area of practice in this case, because he has violated several regulations governing mammography providers. The disciplinary matrix provides discretion to the Texas Medical Board, and they have used that discretion to say that Dr. Guevara cannot practice or own an imaging service at all. And it encompasses all of his imaging practice instead of just mammography, because at the Texas Medical Board's finding of fact 24, they found that Dr. Guevara failed to adequately supervise his employees in MAB's radiology department. It was the entire department. It was not limited to mammography. That being said, there is substantial evidence to support MAB's final order because 100% of the images that DSHS sampled were found to be of poor quality on a review by the American College of Radiology. And 100% of those 30 images that were sampled could not be used to determine whether or not cancer, whether or not the patient had cancer. Not a single image was usable. And so this creates an extreme risk to the patients. They could have cancer and not know about it. They wouldn't be able to follow up and cancer could be they, they could have cancer. That's that's the, the gist of it. And a patient's risk of having cancer without knowing about it and without their provider following up properly with them far outweighs any harm that D Dr. Guevara might face due to having to shut down his imaging service. So at this time, the Texas Medical Board requests that you deny plaintiff's request for a temporary injunction. Thank you. Okay, when does the TRO expire? I believe it's today, Your Honor. Today? I, I, I think that's right, Your Honor. Okay, all right. I'm going to take this under advisement. Uh, we're off the record. When do you, um, have y'all provided um, Ms. Latham with proposed orders? Um, uh, we have it available. We can email it to Ms. Latham. Um, is it just the 353 submission? Um, actually, um, you received a link, I mean, uh, for this hearing on an email where she's copied. So we'll do, you'll get it in a couple of minutes. All right. Your Honor, we'll, we'll furnish a proposed order and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll run it by Mr. Lau before we send it. All right. Thank you. Just kidding. If you made it through all of that, you deserve a resolution. Judge Connor denied the motion for the temporary injunction, so Dr. Guevara is prohibited from owning, overseeing, operating, etc., the supervising any of those things, any kind of diagnostic testing imaging facility. He is allowed to continue to operate his other primary care practices. So he doesn't really have any course of appeal left that will continue on. And I will put a link to the 
full order in the description if you would like to read it for yourself. There's a lot more to it than the defense led you to believe, but the prosecutor summed it up pretty good in the closing arguments. That one was a little different. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care, everyone. Thank you.